I'm standing here, I picked up a copy of the uh, Fly Fishing Magazine um, and uh, I was intrigued about the flies because uh, although I was fishing, um, I was doing a lot of uh, sea fishing with baits etc, I didn't have any idea about the fly. Little did I know about the Macedonian fly and then we found the Macedonian fly and we forgot all about it. So my fishing was in Greece, in small mountain um, streams, tumbling water, fantastic looking fish, five, six inches, you've got a 12 incher, that's the fish of the season, or maybe a lifetime. So that's my background. Until I came to Salisbury, I uh, was on the waiting list for three and a half years, as you do, and then I started fishing in 2010. So, my first experience was fishing West Ainsbury, one of our very, very popular waters. I got in the river, there's a fish, oh, fantastic. There's a second fish, fantastic. Brilliant day. The thing which worried me was that they all look like this. They all had the look and the feel of what's called a homogeneous 14, 15 inch fish that didn't look particularly bright. The tail was a little bit worn out, and sometimes it was just one of the pictorials <laughs> working. It was just going round and round and round. <laughs> I had to venture at the very top of West Ainsbury and hide myself underneath the trees to manage to lure some of the small stockings. The, sorry, the small wildest. We're talking about six or seven inches. <coughs> so that was the start of my journey in 2010. Um, so how did the journey was at the start? The immutable laws of fishing, gentlemen and ladies and gentlemen. All members are entitled to catching the bag limit. How is it possible that you've come here? I've driven from London. I've fished for four hours and I haven't caught any fish. No, there must be something wrong. Fish should be caught at any time, any fly, at any place. <coughs> All fish should be at least one pound in weight, the table size, <laughs> and they should be rising obligingly. <laughs> Come on, I've tried 12 flies, what are you doing to me? You're just inspecting, do you think I'm a fool? <laughs> if members complain they do not catch, more fish should be put in the river, absolutely. If members complain about trees, bushes and fringes, these obstacles should be removed. <laughs> If member cuts their flies on weed, you chop the weed. And if the weed is floating down the river, it's the bloody keepers. <laughs> <laughs> we're continuing. Otters, comrades, goose hunters, we're doomed. <laughs> Comfortable benches. Oh, yeah, absolutely. They're more, they're better. And even better, fishing hats. And why not? Do not ask me to put my word as well as all because you know what? I, I just like um, wearing my uh, flip flops in the summer and my sleepers in the winter to fish. You know, don't ask me to get in the river, too hard for me. And if any of the above is not met, mm, who is to blame? Of course, it's the committees and the club's fault. And I know I've got a pretty bloody good idea. Let's have a vote for a new chairman. <laughs> And then life repeats itself. Um, yes, a gross element of exaggeration in what I said, but it just gives you a feel of what's happening. And uh, can I have hands up if anybody you know, hasn't heard some similar conversations in, in your clubs and your syndicates? I don't see many hands up. Um, so, going into, so that was the start of the journey exaggerated, but nevertheless, yes, uh, there were some attitudes, and it is fair that when members uh, start fishing chalk streams, a lot of them, because having not had the privilege to have access to fishing the chalk stream, they'll be starting fishing small lakes, ponds, if you like, uh, with all the central, the, cent the, 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 the expectations of this type of fishing um, would create. So, um, what we said, let's just take a deep breath and just really rethink where we are, what we want to do, why we want to do it, 
And the, the only thing which I wanted to say is that it's not as complicated as in Brexit, but SADC, it's a big organization. We have 2,200 members. And, and all members, they have different expectations, different backgrounds, different walks in life, different fishing skills, etc. So if we're here, the environment is quite complex. You've got various organizations, you have good organizations, like you know the Wild Trout Trust, the, the, the Angling Trust, some trout conservation, and you have some not as good organizations that you may find them as adversaries down the line. It could be Fish Farm, it could be the Water Company, etc. etc. You do have the members, and uh, 2,200 members, they're, they're a lot um, to manage. You've got landowners, they have a say. You've got the regulators, that'll be the EA and Natural England and all the directives that come from Europe and from here. And you do have the natural environment. Um, so multiple relationships to manage. And of course, these relationships, they're arrows that they're going all over the place. So how do you go about it? Um, this is a disclaimer here. Uh, the star is not to say that we're a star, it's just a typical um, uh, let's say it's, uh, a model which happens in every organization and, um, and we'll talk about these things because for me this is what's this, about this transformation. Um, the first question before you do anything else is why change? And of course the why change, um, it, was, it was coming piece by piece. The first thing I heard Dr. Cyril Bennett, he said to me, do you know what, we've got fantastic fly line. I said, do we? Why do you say that, Cyril? Well, because, you know, I've seen so many bluey nodders that I thought they were gone. That's interesting. Members are saying they're catching fish. Members are saying that we're, we haven't stopped some of the wild, um, the wild uh, parts of our rivers. They weren't stocked, they were catching fish. The rest of the clubs in the area, they're all a lot more environmentally sensitive, they're managing weed in a more sensitive way, they're doing all the good stuff. So we do have some of the elements there, that, and there is a change in uh, customers' perception, or customers' members, if you like, perception. So there's things like catch and release, there's things like, you know what, it's not important to catch and kill and parade with my brace of fish and show my wife and my children and my friends that what a great angler I am. So we had all these things to, to bear. So we say, yeah, well, yeah, it's really worth changing. And what is the vision? These are the first things that we talked about. Of course, then you're saying, well, in order to, if you're clear in where you want to go, and if the wild fishing direction is where you want to go, what is the vision? What do you really want to offer? What are you, um, what are you about as an organisation? Then you have to have the right strategy, you have to have the right structure, you have to have the right people, the right processes and the right systems, or the right information. Right, what is the vision? The vision of the club is to provide true wild fishing chalk stream experience, looking after what's in the river and what's around the river. Um, that is very clear, and this is where we want to be. And the one thing which I wanted to say again and again, it is a journey, and the journey continues. And it doesn't happen overnight, and it doesn't happen if you try to sit on people. You have to work, and it's really heart and mind, and you do it in an evolutionary way rather than a revolutionary way. So let's talk about the strategy then. What we did was we said, well, do you know what? Long term is very important because we have to think about where we want to be. Everything that we do in terms of how we manage the rivers, anything in terms of how we buy the equipment, how we manage the members, it has to be long term rather than short term. So that means that, well, actually, it's not very important if somebody doesn't catch a fish for the day. We don't need to have a knee to your reaction and put the fish back in the river. Building lasting relationships, crucial with everybody. We saw all the different stakeholders. And we're not here 
for today. We're not here for tomorrow. We're here for 20, 30, 40 years ahead. So we have to be robust in how we build these relationships. Strong geographic focus. Uh, I remember conversations like a meeting. Oh, I heard that there's um, a nice stretch which is going, uh, well, whereabouts is it? Oh, the upper region. I said, well, we're called the Salisbury and District Angry Club. So you have to understand where your strengths and your weaknesses are. So there was very, very strong geographic focus behind that. Continuity, continuous improvement. That's something that in my previous business life I wasn't allowed to do because the, the idea there is that you do your work and every time that you do, you try to improve. That's continuous improvement. So you don't need to be changing directions and do something totally different each and every time. So that was the strategy, if you like, behind it. And last and but foremost, is the community and non-for-profit purpose of the club. Uh, SADC has been on the planet for 75 years and it started with six members. We are, we are 2,200 members. The one thing that hasn't changed is a strong community focus. Once you take the money, relatively speaking, out of the equation, there's one thing that remains, quality. Because you don't worry about profit. You worry about covering your costs, having a little bit of surplus that will go back into where it matters, which is the rivers, and which is the members, because they will be asked to pay over the top to fish. So, so that's the structure <coughs> part. Then we said, well, what about the structure? And there's different structures out there. You have small clubs, you have the syndicates, you have very informal relationships there. How do we go about a club like that? The first thing we did was start with the Constitution. Um, we had elections every two years. Mr. Chairman is here. I said to Mr. Chairman one evening over a couple of pints of speckled hen, I believe it was. I said, what do you mean to say in two years? In two years you can change? Uh, yes. Well, how can we bring this long-term vision, long-term processes, if every two years we're having re-elections. So we changed the constitution and now it's a five year, it's a five year commitment. Um, we added also the word habitat as a club objective to recognize that we're going in this direction and that and we have to be upfront to our members. And also strengthened the club announcement regulations. The club, at least a club of the size of like ours, it has to be able, the committee has to be able to manage the day-to-day -day without having to call an extraordinary meeting to decide whether you're going to be putting two pound fish or two and a quarter, or whether you need to shut down that particular stretch. So the management regulations have been strengthened. Flat structure, um, something to laugh at, but it's very interesting because you may have had a situation where you've got the president, the chairman, the general manager, the head keeper, the, the keeper and the assistant keeper. And we'll be spending all the time going up and down layers, whereas now our keepers are sitting uh, part and parcel of the committee meeting. So the communication happens, the change of information happens at a very, very club level. And yes, there are more senior keepers, but is the um, the, um, it's, it's the first among equals principle, or the primus inter pares that the Latin said, rather than, oh, I don't know that, I need to act as the head keeper. We need to be fluid, we need to be moving very fast to manage 30 miles of rivers. Um, employer employee relationship, that has to be there. Um, they, it's, I understand that a lot of what I'm saying might not be applicable with some of the smaller clubs. But in a big organization, you have to know that, yeah, um, you are employed, I am employed by the club, the keepers are employed um, uh, by the club, so they need to be clear about who the boss is and what the contract, the terms of the contracts are, otherwise it can go all over the place. The committee sets direction, not in a dictatorial way. I said the keepers are part of the committee, they're sitting there. So everything has been discussed. But it sets direction, once the direction is agreed, the office, that's me, 
and the keepers execute. This is how you get standardization. This is how you get the same message repeated again and again and again. So if the members hear the same message from the keeper, from the chairman, from myself, from the bailiffs, then they get it. People, very, very important. Um, committee members can do a broads versus talking shop. Um, you know, there's a lot of anecdote over there and there's a lot of um, pontification going in a number of committees that um, smaller, smaller or larger committees where opinions tend to overrule facts. So we said, look, stop talking too much and try and do more. Consensus management is better than voting. And I am an associate member of the club. I still do not have a voting right, and I did not want a voting right in the first place because I don't believe in voting. I believe in the people behind the voting. Let's just talk about it and just agree and just or disagree or agree, but we'll walk out of the room and we have a consensus decision to move in a certain way. Um, transparency, transparency and honest discussions, that's, um, that's very, very crucial. Um, forget about, you know, I'm just going to make sure that you know, three of my committee they're on my side so that you know we can vote going in this direction. Micro <coughs> got to get them off the table. Focus on where it matters, which is our rivers and our members. And a professional team to manage the club and the rivers. Um, professional team that the, the, the um, they're being developed uh, keepers. Luckily we've got them for the senior keeper is um, over 12 years, we haven't lost any. It's continuous personal development with courses, with, with tutoring, with coaching, etc. Absolutely crucial. So, <laughs> systems and MI, I don't want this to make it sound too, too, too business like. Essentially, what we're saying is what we've heard before from some of our other speakers science and facts instead of anecdote and opinions. Just unbelievable. You know, I can even tell you that, you know, that bit is absolutely crap. Actually, I don't see anything wrong. There's no fish there, don't bother to go and fish it. Who am I? Well, I'm the general manager of the source group. This is kind of crap. So I should know better. No, rubbish! Science and facts. Signing and out boxes and all of our fisheries, that's absolutely crucial because this is when we understand which fisheries they are utilized, how they utilize. Uh, how many fish they caught, when they caught, so we can produce our stats, um, or it's part, which is part of the information. <coughs> Analysis of catch returns, it's not good just to collect the data, but you need to convert it into information. But somebody has to look at it and, and just draw the, the right conclusions. Quantitative electrofishing surveys, fly monitoring surveys, and benchmarks uh, have been very, very um, <coughs> privileged and, and very extremely lucky to have Dr. Cyril Bennett because uh, not on, on, on top of the fly monitoring surveys which we're doing the three minute kick sample um, on 23 of our locations we've also benchmarked our rivers as well using the finger, fingerprinting. And working together with like-minded organizations. I may have forgotten some but you see the Wild Trout Trust, Salmon Trout Conservation, <coughs> Western Soaps and Rivers um, and, uh, Trust, uh, the Agony Trust, uh, the Wilshire Wildlife and um, um, uh, Wildlife Trust, we have to be part of a like-minded system and, um, and to be drawing, leveraging all this information. Um, and of course, last but not least, very strongly to the EA and to uh, Natural England. There's a lot of fingers that they're pointing at the EA and sometimes my finger is one of these fingers. Well, I can tell you, these guys, the, the and some of, some of them, they're probably in the room. At grassroots level or on the riverbank, they do the best they can to support um, a club and any club. The issue is elsewhere. The issue is further up the pyramid. The issue has to be driven by cost cutting, etc., etc. So where are we now? We have reduced our stocking levels by two-thirds. We used to spend in excess of £30,000 because we're a big club. We're putting now £10,000. And you will say, well, why are you carrying stocking? 
because it slowly, slowly cuts your bunk in. It's 30 miles of rubbers. You cannot just do it all overnight. It's not just a stretch and it's not just a small syndicate of four or five or 10, 20, 40 members. It's a big club and it has to be done gradually. Um, the majority of our waters, they're designated as wild fisheries and the designation is actually in the membership book. 90% of the fish caught by wild. Now that's, this is impressive. You're talking to somebody who's averaging fortunately 70 days plus um, on the water fishing. I can put my hands up. I haven't caught a stocking yet this year. Um, average size of wild fish caught has been increasing. Well, why is that? Two things happen there. Um, we reduced, I was looking at some um, stats at Durnford and <coughs> Norwood, um, two or three of your members will be fishing that tomorrow. We used to put 3,000 fish per year. Gradually, that's the key word, gradually, over seven years, we reduced it to just under 800. What do you think is done to the cat's returns? <laughs> Nothing. It's fractionally increased it, but it, in essence, what happened was the people that know how to catch fish, they will catch fish. Pareto's law, 80-20 or 10-90, the difference is they're catching wild fish. And because, by choice, they want to put them back, we give them the right, kill your brace. That's your right, you've got it here. You don't do anything legal, but they choose not to exercise it. So they put them back. If you put them back, the 5 inch becomes a 10 inch the 10 inch becomes a 1 pounder plus. So we start seeing now better uh, bigger fish, wild fish being caught. Habitat monitor is embedded in the day-to-day key, -day keepering. Takes me back to year one. Uh, we were doing a <coughs> habitat work uh, at West Ainsbury and we were sort of um, chewing our fingers on how we're going to put it to the members, etc, etc. Well, it's going to interrupt the fishing. Uh, oh, that's woody debris. Oh, I can catch my fly. I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> that has been now, it's embedded. It's day to day keepering. The keepers are not there to provide fantastic looking grass buns and lovely looking benches. They do that, by the way, anyway. But if a tree falls down, there's, it's pinned there. It's stuck. There, there, something <coughs> that used to be a project that used to be. Oh, we need to get like you know all, all the consents, etc. That's really. I'm not talking about trees that that will flood the place. I'm talking about a little tree or a limb. It becomes part and partial of the day to day. Five minutes. Active, minutes. Five minutes. Yeah, I'll be there. Active entomology centre. Mm -hmm. No need to say anything about that. Um, and um, various habitat improvement projects. This is over and above the day to day and you'll be visiting one of these um, <coughs> projects this afternoon. Um, and around the qualities and proving. Now, what I mean there is not that this guy is catching more fish. Inevitably, he will start catching more fish. But it's more about the appreciation um, of what chalkstream wild fishing is all about. And the conversation it has shifted from Oh, I had a cracking day today. No, I, I had, I had four. I say at least four to six pounders. So bloody jolly good, you know. <laughs> to a conversation with beautiful day. Thank you, club. I came from Cumbria. I sat on the bench. I saw a kingfisher, two or three waterfalls, and I caught a lovely looking wild brown. Was it big? No, it was about six or seven inches. Oh, brilliant. And our waiting list remains robust. We do have, and if anybody's interested, who's not a member, we are sitting at three to three and a half years waiting list. What tends to happen every year, we tend to lose between 100 to 130, 140 members. That's good news and bad news. The, the bad news is that unfortunately some of these people that they go, some of these members, they're not with us anymore. They depart this way. The good news is some of them, they leave because they don't like what we offer. That's fantastic. That's okay, guys. <laughs> That's great. If you don't like catching small uh, wild fish, you don't like the experience, please go and fish elsewhere. The door is open. 
the future. Continue doing the things that matter and improve the way we do things. Remain true to our club purpose and the objectives. That's the thing. It's a community club. It's to provide access to ordinary mortals. We do not vent. We, we do not check for bank accounts. We do not check for PhDs or anything. Anybody can join. But it's not. A, it's a not-for-profit organization. And think about managing 30 miles of rivers with thriving wildfish and invertebrate populations. Isn't that a great thing to think about? And it is possible. Just look at the look at the amazing blowing olive spinnerful. It was just an unbelievable thing. Um, you can see in the background. It's just unbelievable. Um, blowing olives, that was. Columns of um, swarms of blooming olives dancing up and down, tree high, and, and of course, you know, fishing is getting uh, um, quite challenging. So I think probably I missed one or two over there. So it comes there. Yeah, what happened there? No, 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 yeah. Missed that one. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. So it is possible for the government to catch fish. <laughs> so thank you. Many thanks, Andres. Very entertaining.